Hi everyone, welcome to the Space Science Webinar Series. Uh, as you all know, uh, UAE's uh, HOPE mission is now successfully uh, orbiting Mars. Uh, these are very exciting times. Mars is uh, an extremely difficult destination uh, up till the last century. Only the US and the Soviets were able to reach the planet. Then the first two decades of the century, we saw the European Space Agency in India going there. And just last week, we had two new members, uh, UAE and China successfully uh, had their orbiters around the planet. And just uh, two days from now, Thursday, NASA's uh, Perseverance rover is going to land on the planet uh, one of the main objectives of the rover is to look for signs of life. Uh, Mars at one point could have, uh, have hosted life, so that is very exciting. And to learn more about that, we have one of the pioneers of that field, Dr. Frances Westall. Uh, she is uh, the Director of Research at CNRS, the French National Center for Scientific Research. She's also the leader of the exobiology group there. She got her PhD in marine biology, in marine geology from University of Cape Town in South Africa. She did postdocs in Germany, France, Italy. She was an NRC fellow at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. And she has been involved with uh, the ExoMars mission since the late 90s and it is scheduled to launch next year. So we are very excited for the mission and for her to join her. And so Dr. Vestal, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and it's all yours. Fine, thank you very, very much for this invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be talking to you all. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the comparisons between early Mars and early Earth. But first of all, uh, we mentioned the HOPE uh, orbiter. Congratulations to the, uh, for, for the successful in, insertion of the HOPE orbiter in, into the Martian atmosphere. And I have a first image here, which was sent to me by Bruce Joukowsky, who's working with you uh, on the orbiter, uh, showing the uh, the surface of Mars and uh, some haze related to atmospheric uh, conditions. Let's change my pointer. Okay. So I want to talk to you today about quite a few things, uh, early Mars and early Earth, uh, especially about the definition of habitability, because everybody talks about habitability, but what is it? And I want to show you that habitable conditions are different uh, depending on whether you're talking about the emergence of life established life or dormant life. And I'll speak very, very briefly about the emergence of life on Earth, but from the geologist's point of view, and you'll see why soon. Uh, then we'll look at the evolution of habitability on Mars through time and its consequences for possible Martian life if, Mars, if life is there. Also, what kind of Mar life do we expect on Mars? I will speak about my mission, the ExoMars 2020 mission, the European Russian mission, and also about sample return. So uh, this is a picture of myself in the field in South Africa. I'm actually South African by birth, and I'm in the Barbton mountain land uh, where the rocks are about three and a half billion years old. These are the oldest well-preserved rocks in the world. I am by training a geologist, but I'm also now an astrobiologist. Uh, Olia, I'm, as uh, uh, Demetra has said, I'm head of the exobiology group at the CNRS, the Centre for Molecular Biophysics in Olia. Olia is in the centre of, of France. It's an old medieval city. And uh, this is a, a, a rogues gallery photograph of the people in my group, people working with us. Uh, it's a small group, but we're very diverse from physicists to geologists, prebiotic chemists, uh, geobiologists, uh, space engineers, another prebiotic chemist, and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a very nice, vibrant group. So to get on with the talk, um, why am I comparing Mars and the Earth? Here, here's a space view of the Earth today, where we see the continents. Of course, this is South Africa, um, uh, one of my favorite hunting grounds for the ancient rocks. And Mars today, uh, a cold desert and a very habitable planet. But in the past, they were quite different. 
uh, if we think about the Earth about four billion years ago, uh, it was we have to consider the Earth as a completely different planet with extreme environmental conditions. It was basically an oceanic planet, an ocean planet, with some uh, pieces of land, uh, such like the volcanoes exposed uh, on uh, the backs of oceanic plateau. The, the, this is a space view of the Hawaii Islands. This is what the early Earth would have looked like. Quite a few of these little uh, pieces of land uh, around the surface, but no, no big continents as we have today. And in it, uh, the, the environmental conditions were totally, totally different. This is an artist's view of what the early Earth looks like, looks like uh, with a carbon dioxide atmosphere, very hot uh, impact craters, uh, uh, hydrothermal vents, activity everywhere. The moon a lot closer to the Earth. And in fact, the, the day was probably about 12 to 14 hours long, uh, and the Earth was spinning a lot long, uh, faster than it uh, uh, does today. So if, if we look at the global environmental conditions on the early Earth and, and compare them to today's conditions, uh, what's really important for life, and especially for the origin of life, uh, is the water temperature at the crust and the sea interface. On the early Earth, that was hot. It was a very hot planet. Uh, we're looking at temperatures over 60 degrees centigrade today. It's four degrees centigrade. The pH, uh, because of the CO2 atmosphere, uh, carbon dioxide dissolved in water makes uh, weak carbonic acid, so we have slightly acidic conditions. Uh, remember, these are global environmental conditions. Slight, uh, acid, slightly acidic pH to neutral compared with neutral today. The atmosphere, mostly carbon dioxide, with a very small amount of oxygen, not less than 0.2% uh, of present atmospheric levels, and oxygen produced by abiotic processes. Today, we have an, uh, an atmosphere composed of nitrogen and oxygen. Because there was no oxygen, no ozone layer, so high levels of radiation reaching the surface of the Earth, about 54 watts per square meter compared to one watt per square meter, and this is DNA weighted, uh, and going up to as much as 1,000 watts per square meter. A huge amount of volcanic activity, a huge amount of hydrothermal activity, a lot of impacts. So totally different uh, planets very extreme, but we have to consider that the early Earth uh, was extremely normal for many extraterrestrial rocky planets today, and probably uh, exo, uh, in the solar system and exoplanets. So um, the conditions on the Earth today are very unusual. So let's talk about habitability and Mars. What is habitability? Uh, a very simple definition is uh, uh, a place that's habitable is a place that's fit to be inhabited. Uh, but then, as I mentioned, there are habitable conditions for the emergence of life, habitable conditions for sustaining established life, and conditions in which life simply survives, like dormancy. Uh, why do we talk about habitability on early Mars if it's a cold desert today? Well, because there are, uh, plenty, there's plenty of evidence uh, for that uh, there was quite a lot of water on the surface of the planet uh, in the past, about four billion years ago. For instance, we see here valleys uh, uh, eroded by water, dry rivers now. Uh, these are uh, images taken by Mars Express. Uh, we see uh, deposits of uh, hydrated minerals such as clays, which most likely formed uh, underwater or by the influence of water on, on volcanic rocks. Again, this is a Mars Express uh, analysis. Uh, we also see ice. Uh, when Phoenix landed uh, uh, close to the North Pole, uh, it dug a trench. And uh, on the first day, three little particles or grains were seen. You can see a, a close up here of these grains. And then a, a day or so later, they disappeared. And this was actually water ice that had sublimated in, in, the, uh, in the dry Martian atmosphere. So uh, we don't know exactly how much water was on, on Mars in the past, and it was probably quite variable, but there was water on Mars. And here's an artist's impression of uh, a water, a water rich early Mars compared to Mars today. 
Um, and remember that uh, these uh, these early rocky planets with water, uh, they, were, uh, they were the kinds of habitable extraterrestrial bodies, uh, which are likely to populate the whole universe. Uh, and these are bodies which uh, may host primitive anaerobic life forms. And I'll talk about these life forms a little bit later. So uh, if, we, if we look at, uh, compare the uh, global uh, com conditions on between early Earth and early Mars, uh, about 4 billion years ago, again, temperatures at the water uh, crust interface quite high. Um, again, as, uh, the water would have been slightly acidic, carbon dioxide atmosphere, high levels of radiation, uh, high degree of volcanism, hydrothermal activity, high degree of impacts. So very, very similar global uh, conditions. Uh, but let's have a look at the habitable conditions now for the emergence of life. Well, yeah, this is again is an artist's impression of the early Earth on which uh, life emerged. You see the volcano tops just sticking out of the water here. Of course, we need water. <clears throat> we need organic molecules. And they most of the organic molecules probably came from extraterrestrial sources like carbonaceous chondrites and uh, micrometeorites. There were also endogenous, uh, endogenous by uh, probiotic molecules, by uh, sources of uh, organic molecules that, uh, within the crust. Uh, also within, possibly within the early atmosphere. Life also needs energy, which came from uh, radiation, UV radiation, chemical energy, hydrothermal energy, heat, as well as, very importantly, a geological context. I always like to stress this because most people, uh, the people who are working in the origins of life field are chemists, and they don't know anything about geology, and they think geology is just a uh, useless, out of the way, it's, it's not relevant, etc. But without geology, there would be no life. So this is why without geology, there would be no life. The, this is my very simple uh, recipe for making life. We haven't done it yet, of course. Uh, we're trying in the laboratory. So the ingredients of life are the essential elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And these ingredients come from rocks. And then uh, they need to be, they, they need to get together, they need to be catalyzed, and the energy for the, uh, the catalyzers and the energy come from minerals. Uh, they, uh, the stimulated, uh, the stimulation creates complex molecule, molecular species, which are called uh, a living species. Uh, this term was given to me by a prebiotic chemist, chemist who said that living species are not yet protocells. I'll leave this one out because uh, I don't quite understand this one, but let's go to the protocell. Uh, the the uh, com continued complexification of organic molecules on mineral surfaces leads to uh, a variety of uh, types of molecules, uh, giving us a protocell with some kind of information transferring uh, molecule, proteins and membranes. Now, the, these all important minerals and rocks, they were uh, very frequent on the early earth. Uh, they were typical of the, the rocks of the early earth. Uh, the meteoritic material was also very useful, uh, plus uh, various types of uh, reactions occurring in the crust uh, and within hydrothermal systems. These are some of the minerals that uh, are very useful in helping to uh, complexify and uh, help the structuring of uh, various uh, organic molecules. So they help to concentrate the organic molecules. They help the structural organization. They provide the uh, reaction, uh, the reduction oxidation um, reactions at their surfaces provide energy as well as small organic molecules. And they contribute also to the chirality of the molecules. I, I won't speak any more about that, but um, I can maybe ask, answer some questions. So the bottom line is, if there are no minerals, like if there is no rocks, there is no life. So no rocks and hot water, no life, or no hot rocks and uh, water, no life. We need the hydrothermal energy from the hydrothermal systems. So how long did it take for life to appear on Earth? We have absolutely no idea. Uh, all we know is that it had to be a really quick uh, process or relatively quick process. 
Not a process that dragged on for millions and millions of years, but a quick process because otherwise the molecules that uh, uh, form the various ingredients of a cell will break down. So we're probably we're looking at time scales, perhaps of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even years, or maybe one to two millions of millions of years. But on that time scale, what about the spatial scale? You need a body of water containing the ingredients of life, the carbon molecules, the nutrients, the energy. That's get, going to last for this time scale. So we're looking at bodies of water of the order of a couple of hundred kilometers and more. Uh, and here I have, I have uh, put some images of the various locations where people think life might have appeared. For instance, in uh, hydrothermal vents, uh, tidal pools, uh, hydrothermal vents on land, hydrothermal sediments. This is my favorite uh, environment. Anyway, so uh, the bottom line is a habitable body means a rocky body with hot water in contact with rocks. Uh, and this means, uh, and given the spatial scales, the whole planet does not need to be habitable for the emergence of life. Uh, habitability can be patchy because there can be different types of habitable conditions occurring at different times and in different places. This is what I call punctuated habitability. And this is the situation for Mars. So uh, this means that life could have emerged on water worlds such as the early Earth, early Venus, the ITIS, ISIS satellites in the solar system, as well as exoplanets, or landlocked worlds with lakes like Mars or also exoplanets. Very quickly, let's have a look at the habitable conditions for sustaining established life and the conditions in which life simply survives, because these are quite different. Now, once life has appeared, it's there. It's very difficult to get rid of. We know when we get a cold or flu, uh, the bugs are there. It takes a long time to get rid of them. So the scare, once life is around, it can uh, rapidly colonize uh, a location that has become habitable on a time scale of hours, days, weeks to years. To give you an example here, um, you see a, a, a green stream uh, and uh, in a sort of gray uh, ground mass. This gray ground mass is the siliceous deposit around uh, hot springs in Yellowstone Park in Montana. And this stream is actually very, very hot. It's the outflow of a hot spring. And uh, it, uh, it's full of photosynthesizing algae like, uh, and uh, pho phototrophs like cyanobacteria, while the, the, the silica is barren. So this is a, an ephemeral, ephemerally habitable environment on a scale of perhaps days, uh, months. Um, so the sp spatial scale uh, is, it can be small or it can be kilometers uh, uh, in size. Uh, it basically means a body of water containing the ingredients of life, carbon molecules, nutrients, and energy again. What about uh, dormancy? Well, dormancy, uh, what does dormancy mean? It means that the uh, cells are surviving with no water or no carbon or no nutrients or no energy or any combination of these. And cells can survive up to a certain period of time in certain conditions. I have shown here microbial cells that are surviving in inclusions in salt crystals. And uh, this, depending on who, who you listen to, this could be uh, over periods of hundreds of thousands of years to even millions of years. But survival is not living, it's just survival. And after a certain period of time, if the cells cannot uh, resuscitate, if they cannot uh, divide, then they will die. And just to give you an, uh, an indication of how slow cells can divide, uh, there are microbes living uh, in the deep sea, in deep sea sediments at depths of about two kilometers. They divide about once every 1,000 1, years. So coming back to Mars, uh, uh, looking at the evolution of habitability on the planet, this is a sketch taken from a paper by Dave de Marie. Uh, we have the, the scale bar here, four billion years ago to today. Early Mars had water, the ingredients of life. It's quite possible that life appeared. 
uh, and that there were viable microbes at the surface. But with time, as the, the planet became a cold desert, it lost its, it lost its volatiles, water and at, most of its atmosphere. And if there are any signs of life at the surface, we're most likely looking at fossil microbes. Is there still life on Mars? Well, we don't know. It's possible that viable microbes still survive somewhere under the, uh, underground today. I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, this uh, idea of punctuated habitability and changes in habitability through various time slices through Martian history. So we'll go for the, the first time slice, let's say about 4.2 billion years ago. We have a planet that has uh, liquid water on the surface and life has emerged at two locations, note two different locations. Uh, so some couple of hundred, uh, hundreds of million year, millions of years later, uh, life is flourishing in these two original uh, locations and it has appeared elsewhere, but at a different time. Uh, again, so several hundreds of millions of years later, life has become ex extinguished in one of these oases because it's no longer ha habitable, continues in another oasis. Uh, so. And, and then uh, once that the planet became um, dehydrated at the surface, inhospitable, life may have, uh, well, life completely uh, disappeared uh, uh, from the surface, but it may be somewhere in the subsurface, either uh, in dormancy or um, metabolizing uh, quietly. Now, let's have a look at another situation where uh, we could have uh, the situation where we have recolonization of the surface. If there's an impact, for instance, that has touched, uh, that has uh, uh, influenced an aquifer or water-bearing layer under the surface, life, uh, any, any uh, surviving cells, uh, viable cells could come to the surface and they could metabolize for the period of time uh, that uh, the local in, uh, habitable environment is habitable. Um, but then uh, we could also have the situation where if you have an impact in one area of the, the, the planet, which was habitable, uh, this impact could have uh, uh, transported viable cells to another area. The bottom line is that the, all of these habits, habitats were rarely or never uh, connected. And we can think about the term uh, uninhabited habitats. This is a, a, the um, title of a paper by Charlie Coquel and colleagues. So habitats do not necessarily need to be inhabited. So uh, when we're thinking about uh, Mars, we need to keep in mind that the totality of the surface has never been permanently habitable. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the concept of punctuated habitability, uninhabited habitats, or lack of connectivity of habitats. This means that there was a lack of opportunity for evolution. If life did appear, it is likely uh, that it would have remained extremely primitive, something like our terrestrial anaerobic chemotrophs. This means it will be very small and very difficult to find. And uh, if life still exists, it will be underground and uh, it will require deep drilling to get to it. So all the other missions that, we're, we've, we've, that have been previously mentioned, ExoMars, Perseverance and, and um, Curiosity Mars uh, Science Laboratory, they're looking for traces of fossil life at the surface. So what about these primitive life forms? Uh, they, I've, I've uh, put on this slide some images of the kinds of primitive life forms we might expect on Mars. They won't be exactly the same, of course, if there were, uh, is life on or was life on Mars. But we're looking at uh, uh, chemotrophs. Uh, I, I'll explain a bit later exactly what they are. They, these are uh, organisms that um, live off inorganic matter, chemolithotrophs. And these are some of the some uh, electron microscope images of these organisms. And they're very small. Look at this, the scale bar here is about half a micron, so they're about less than a micron in size. Occasionally, where there's a there are a lot of nutrients, for instance, around hydrothermal vents. These are very nutrient rich environments. You can get uh, fantastic development of these uh, microorganisms, and they form kinds of films. So. 
uh, chemotrophs. Chemotrophs are organisms that obtain their energy from oxidation of inorganic substrates such as minerals or hydrogen or organic carbon. They uh, obtain their carbon from carbon dioxide dissolved in water or from organic matter. So uh, I have a little sketch here to illustrate uh, an example because I'm going to show you examples from the early earth. And uh, this is a sketch to explain what I'm going to show you. Uh, the early planets, Mars and Venus were highly volcanic. All the sediments were volcanic particles, volcanic detritus. So imagine you have a volcanic particle here uh, and it is colonized by the kinds of organisms that I call the rock eaters, chemolithotrophs. Uh, they they are getting their oxidation from uh, uh, ox redox re reactions on minerals and uh, their carbon from uh, carbon dioxide in, in the seawater. So these are the first settlers of this volcanic particle. But when they've exhausted their, uh, the nutrients, the, the possibility of energy from the volcanic particle, they die. And they are colonized in turn by the chemoorganotrophs. I call them the cannibals because they use the pre-existing organic carbon as and uh, they oxidize it for energy and uh, they, they use the carbon to build up their own cells. And these organisms can be fossilized. I'll be showing you some examples now uh, of relevance for Mars. So uh, in this sketch, imagine uh, that this line here is the surface of a bacterium and all these spikes uh, these are what we call functional groups. The surface of a bacterium is like a, imagine it like a hedgehog with all of these uh, functional groups uh, at the surface. Now, uh, these functional groups attract uh, ions in solution, for instance, could be silica, calcium, iron, or, or others. And these ions polymerize around, or they, 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 they precipitate around the surface. In these slides, we, you were looking at ultra thin sections of microbial cells. These are 90 nanometers thick and they're observed with the transmission electron microscope. This is the cell wall and the black dots are minerals that have started to precipitate around the cell. And with time, the minerals polymerize. As you can see this, this uh, crust around the cell here, the organism dies, the black spotted material is the rest of its uh, organic matter, but it's preserved, it's fossilized. Uh, and on the early earth, we find these kinds of uh, fossilized cells in some of the oldest uh, preserved rocks, well-preserved rocks on earth. Uh, I have, you have see here a field view of a nicely struck rock. It comes from Australia, the Pilbara. It's three and a half billion years old, and it's formed of layers of volcanic sediments that were deposited in a shallow water environment, very similar to these cross-bedded uh, volcanic sediments in Gale, Gale Crater. There are only two areas in the world where we find these really well old, the oldest well-preserved sediments there in, in the northwest of uh, Australia here, the Pilbara, and in Barberton in South Africa. Uh, there are some old sediments in the south of Greenland, but they are highly uh, altered by metamorphism and they're quite uh, difficult to study. So what do we do to uh, look for, search for fossils in a rock like this? Uh, first of all, we study the rock and the structures in the rock because it, the, the, all of these structures, all of this information is what we call the geological context. It he helps us to make an interpretation of the environments and in actual fact, these layers and layers of volcanic uh, ash and sediment were deposited in a tidal channel on a beach. That means it's very, very shallow water. So we take a sample. In actual fact, I took this piece of rock here, but this is a, a cut section of that piece of rock. And um, the, the, these uh, inclined layers here uh, indicate that uh, the, the sediment was in, uh, in, um, influenced by tidal currents and the flat lying layers here mean uh, volcanic ash just settling down uh, quietly in, uh, in a basin of water. So we make a thin section of this rock and this is the thin section, it's, uh, it's about 30 microns thick that we look at with the uh, optical microscope. And in this thin section, we can see all of these particles, all of these dark uh, features. Uh, these, these are volcanic particles. Uh, these are the original sediments. So 
these are the original sediments. And if you notice that very often they have dark outlines. Well, they have dark outlines for a reason. Uh, this is an example of one of these, these particles. It's actually a piece of volcanic glass. And uh, this, this volcanic glass uh, is actually uh, outlined uh, by carbon. The green is, car this is a Roman spectral map of carbon around the edge of the particle. So you'll be thinking, well, why is there carbon there? Well, there's carbon there because it was colonized by microbes. Uh, in the bottom right, you can see a kind of carpet of balls and these balls are, are dividing, they have different sizes. Uh, these are actually fossilized microbes coating one of the volcanic particles. I remind you, this rock is nearly three and a half billion years old, and we see fossil, dividing fossil bacteria. And even better still, you can still see the meniscus between the dividing bacteria. And in this example, you can see uh, two species, a larger microbe and a, a smaller microbe. And one side, uh, one of the dividing, uh, uh, one of the dividing cells here is dead because it's deflated. So we have life and death uh, uh, preserved um, by fossilization with silica three and a half billion years ago. Now, <clears throat> the, these fossil microbes still contain carbon. I mentioned before that the, the organic carbon, the, the molecules that form the life, uh, the cells uh, degrade. And this is a, a, a carbon map just showing the distribution of carbon associated with these cells. So we can analyze the carbon and uh, the, the um, uh, delta 13 carbon uh, content um, value is about minus 26 per mil, which is consistent with the presence of life. But the question is, how do we get from a rock? And uh, I have, the, these rocks are very, very, very hard because they've been silicified. How do we get from a rock to such uh, to to be able to see the fossil bacteria in it? Well, um, I developed a method myself uh, because we we can't uh, use uh, hammers and all the various methods that uh, people normally use for exposing dinosaur bones or these beautiful trilobite fossils. Uh, these all these structures are about one micron in size, so we have to use something else. And we use a technique, well, I use a technique called etching. Um, if you take a, a, a rock surface, you take a piece of the rock, you break it, uh, and it just looks more or less flat. But there are fossil microbes inside. And the fossil microbes are full of uh, organic carbon or carbonaceous molecules. After etching, for instance, with hydrofluoric acid, in this case, uh, the, uh, the carbonaceous uh, fossilized microbes are um, uh, that there's, it's, it's like dirty silica compared to the pure silica that's surrounding them. And so they stand out uh, after the etching. And there's a lovely example here. We have uh, the background. This is a quartz crystal. And uh, these uh, uh, triangular pits are etch marks from the hydrofluoric acid. This rock actually comes from South Africa. It's 3.42 billion years old. But you can see still coming uh, half embedded in, in, in the quartz crystal, a fossilized microbe starting to be exposed. And you can still see the cell division here. So absolutely exquisite preservation. But these, uh, these are, uh, the, when we're looking for fossil microbes, we have to think what, what kinds of uh, biosignatures are we looking for? Uh, we, we could be looking for the cell components, which are the carbon molecules, and we can uh, study various aspects, the composition, the structure, various patterns of the carbon molecules. We can look for cell metabolic activity, even if they're fossilized, because uh, metabolizing cells can uh, produce uh, either directly or indirectly uh, minerals, biominerals directly, for instance, magnetite in tiny magnetite crystals in magnetotectic uh, bacteria, or indirectly like uh, precipitated carbonate. Uh, the the meta metabolic uh, activity concentrates transition metal ions uh, because they're very useful in metabolism and uh, the, the cell, uh, cell component structure, such as nickel, nickel copper, manganese, cobalt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They also concentrate the isotopic ratios, as I mentioned, especially with carbon. 
But uh, the, the, fossil, uh, the actual physical structures, the cells, the colonies, biofilms, mats, extracellular polymeric su substances can be fossilized, but they can also be imitated by uh, abiogenic artifacts. So there are a whole lot of different kinds of uh, methods that we can use to, uh, to uh, try to identify fossil microbes. It's hard enough on, on Earth, uh, where we have the best laboratories in the world, it's even harder in situ on Mars, but that's what we will be doing. So now I want to talk to you about uh, the, um, uh, the ExoMars 2022 mission. I started working with ExoMars in 1996, and it's now 2021. Uh, so if anyone's interested in working with a mission, start young. Anyway, uh, this is a wonderful mission uh, with, uh, with a drill. Uh, um, it will be launched next year. Uh, it has a, a, a very, very useful complementary suite of payload instruments. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the panoramic camera, the high resolution camera, uh, and the uh, long distance infrared uh, spectrometer. These are like the geologist in the with field instruments. Uh, these are the eyes of the geologist. And then uh, associated, that's also a, a little uh, microscope, which I've shown here. We'll see a, a picture of this uh, better. Uh, the microscope used to be on the arm, but for budgetary ease, reasons, the arm was amputated. So it's now on the drill housing, but it's still very useful. And this is my instrument. I'm co-PI of this instrument, and I was the person who uh, proposed it. Uh, there are other instruments uh, for looking at the subsurface. For instance, there's a, um, a ground penetrating radar called Wisdom. Uh, there's a um, neutron detector uh, for trying to detect uh, water or hydrogen in the subsurface. Uh, in, in the body of the rover, uh, there, is, uh, there are three instruments, uh, Raman spectroscopy, spectrometer, uh, an infrared spectrometer, and uh, laser desorption or uh, G, uh, gas chromatograph uh, mass spectrometer for analyzing samples that would be taken by the drill. Now, um, the, the drill will uh, drill down to about two, two meters. Uh, to obtain uh, some samples uh, at, at that particular depth. But before I talk about the drill, let's uh, quickly tell you about the, um, the, the uh, Oxyplanum landing site. Uh, Oxyplanum, the, land, uh, Oxy, uh, the landing site was chosen close to what may have been an early, early ocean or water basin uh, at the north, uh, in the North Pole of Mars. Uh, it's really, it's very, very, very flat, uh, but it's safe for landing. Uh, and uh, this is, this is uh, the landing ellipse that we'll be using. It's about 120 kilometers long and about 10 kilometers wide. Now, this landing area was chosen for two reasons. Uh, to be honest, it was the engineers who pulled the shots basically um, because they wanted the flattest area possible. For, for a geologist like myself, I was not happy because I want exposure, I want to see rocks anyway. So this is a, a, an artist's impression of the landing site area. We have here uh, the edge of a delta, which is on the uh, south, southeast side of the landing area. We probably won't get there. So our landing area will look something like this. But, uh, the main reason for going to Oxyplan is because uh, from orbit, uh, hydrated minerals have been identified and uh, it's believed that, um, well, it's hoped that if there were signs of life on Mar uh, in this particular area in the past, uh, that organic molecules derived from uh, the cells would be trapped in the clay particles. So this is a, an artist's impression of, uh, of, of the rover. Uh, the rover is built by the Italians and our uh, project scientist, Jorge Bargo, who's of Italian descent originally, uh, he always complains that, uh, about the, the, the shape of the rover because he says the Italians built the most beautiful cars like Maserati, Ferrari, etc., etc., and yet they build a bathtub. In fact, at, at the European Space Agency, the body of the rover is called the bathtub. Anyway, this is our, our microscope on the top of the, uh, the, the drill. Uh, it's very versatile. It can um, 
take photographs at distance and uh, close up. This is a photograph of the microscope. It's less than one kilometer um, in weight and uh, has a resolution of about 12 to 15 uh, microns at 10, per pixel at 10 centimeters. So the, uh, we'll be able to photograph outcrops if we see any outcrops, although it's most likely to be flat. But just, just remember that the size of the microbes that I was talking to you about, half a micron in size, that's, uh, or a micron in size, they're tiny. We won't be able to see those on Mars. Uh, but the, the microscope will, will be able to, uh, to photograph. In fact, it's the only instrument that can photograph the, the, the drill core that will be taken at two, uh, two meters depth. Uh, and um, I think I've got, a, yes, I've got a photograph here. We've been doing some tests with uh, analog drill cores. So this is, this is the size. The, the drill cores will be about three, three centimeters uh, in length and about a, a centimeter in width. So this is the kind of uh, thing that uh, we're hoping to see with our instruments in the drill core. Why drilling down to two two meters. It's really fundamental for this particular mission. And uh, it's, it's the reason why uh, the ExoMars uh, 2022 mission is really quite special. You'll see uh, for the, the uh, NASA missions have shown us that if you, if you look at this, where, where the rover wheels have, have traveled and where uh, the drill on the Curiosity uh, rover has drilled, you see that there's a difference between the oxidized surface and the uh, unoxidized uh, subsurface material. In actual fact, the surface of Mars is radiated by UV radiation, by cosmic and galactic radiation. And uh, it's been estimated that it's necessary to drill to about at least 1.5 meters uh, to, to get to um, a depth of material that hasn't been altered over the last three billion years. So this is why it's so important. Now, uh, Mars sample return, Jezero Crater and the Perseverance uh, rover that's going to land on th Thursday night. This is a lovely image of uh, the distribution of minerals uh, as uh, identified from orbit uh, around the delta in Jezero Crater. Again, uh, hydrated minerals or mi kinds of minerals that are produced by water have been uh, pr uh, chosen as the landing site. Uh, this is uh, the Perseverance rover. With its core, it has a core of six centimeters. It will be taking samples, uh, I think about 30 odd samples uh, to, to be stored, to be brought back to Earth. Uh, to search for traces of life, but also uh, to look at, uh, try to date the, the, the Martian terrain and do many other essential analyses that cannot be done in situ. Uh, the, the samples will be left on the surface of Mars. Uh, they will be fetched by a fetch rover here, shown here. This, is a Europe, this will be a European fetch rover that will bring uh, the samples back into, in a container that will be launched into space retrieved in orbit and then brought back to Earth. But the very best, and I'm going to finish my talk here, is to have a, a, a human geologist on Mars. I, I worked at the Johnson Space Center from 1970, 1998 to 2001, well, Johnson Space Center and the Lunar Planetary Institute in Houston. When I went there, I was sure I was going to be the first geologist on Mars. Well, we're looking at something, uh, you know, it's nearly 25 years ago, and uh, I'm not going to get, get to Mars, but hopefully one of the young people who are listening will. Uh, to be honest, uh, a human geologist on Mars can do in one week what a rover can do in one year. So thank you very much, and I'm well, I will welcome any questions. Right. Thanks so much, Dr. Vesto. That was a great talk. Uh, now... Yeah, please uh, type your questions, raise your hand. Uh, let us start uh, with Shane. Let me allow you to talk. Oh, he wants to go to Mars. <laughs> yeah, Shane, go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, I... Shane doesn't look like, okay. 
Next question is by Mazin. Let me. There are others, uh, you know, you can see them. Yeah. Yeah, Mazin, go ahead. Hello. Um, on Earth, we use uh, Delta carbon 13 values to support whether a sample has biogenic origins. Um, you mentioned that in your talk, um, because we know on Earth that there's a fixed carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio, and as life has a preference for the light isotope, we can establish whether um, the sample had a biogenic origin. My question is on Mars, do we know if there is like a, a uniform planet-wide ratio? Can we use like similar techniques to establish a sample's biogenic origin? Mm. Actually, that, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, well, there, there are two aspects. Uh, in the first place, the, the excess of uh, C12 in, bio, in, uh, in cellular material uh, can actually be imitated and is imitated in a lot of abiotic uh, meteorite carbon. With the exception of the highly negative values, uh, C13 values uh, uh, that are found in methanotrophic microorganisms, all the values that we see on Earth can be imitated in uh, by extraterrestrial carbon. The thing is that where, when you look looking at uh, extraterrestrial carbon, for instance, in, in, in meteorites, the range of values is huge, but the range of values in terrestrial life forms uh, or the remains of terrestrial life forms is limited. So Mars, yes, this is one of the this is one of the reasons that uh, we would like to get samples back from Mars. Uh, obviously, the organic carbon will be analysed, and we do have samples from Mars already. There, there are. I don't know how many Martian meteorites, I think maybe 150 Martian meteorites or more uh, known today, and uh, they contain uh, carbonaceous molecules, but this is abi abiogenic carbon. So um, this is, in fact, uh, Perseverance is, uh, in Jezero Crater will be sampling uh, what are believed to be deposits of carbonate and this will give us an idea of the background, uh, the Martian background signature, because uh, on Earth, carbonate, uh, you know, mineral carbonate is the background signature and it's about zero per mil. So we're presuming it should be similar to, to Mars. I hope I've answered your question. You have, thank you. Uh, Shane, go ahead. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was muted yes. and, and didn't have a microphone plugged in. Bit of a disaster on my end. Um, I have two questions. One is really simple, uh, but you talked about possible extant life uh, beneath the surface. And how do you go about searching for that without potentially compromising the life itself? Oh, another really good question. Uh, well, in actual fact, planetary protection uh, is... It is really, really, really important in Martian exploration. Uh, we, uh, all missions to Mars uh, will uh, have to go through very stringent uh, cleansing protocols to make sure that uh, we don't export terrestrial organisms uh, or molecules to Mars. It's quite difficult, but uh, in fact, it doubles the cost of a mission, literally. Mm. Also, uh, in terms of planetary protection, uh, there's, um, there are certain regions of Mars called special regions where, uh, where liquid water may be stable at the surface for very brief periods of time. And uh, if uh, we're not, no mission is uh, at least no European uh, NASA mission is allowed to go anywhere near these areas just in case we concede terrestrial life. So as you say, when we drill down, uh, this is going to take quite a lot of infrastructure. Uh, can it be done robotically? Uh, possibly, for instance, if we can, if some kind of um, uh, outpost is established on one of the moons, Phobos or Deimos, that can be that can control robotic drilling activity. 
Uh, everything will have to be really uh, sterilized, but all nations need to accept the protocol and the necessity of keeping Mars clean. Now, I finished my slide with a photograph of myself in an astronaut suit, mm -hmm. which was a little bit provo provocative. Uh, I'm, I have to say that in 1998, uh, when I went to NASA, uh, I was part of a group, we were planning a human mission to Mars in 2005, before we understood how difficult it was. So uh, as soon as humans go anyway, anywhere, they are dirty. Uh, cells leak out of spacesuits. So uh, a human presence on Mars automatically means contamination. Uh, and that puts the onus on the explorers, the exploring nation to uh, take as many precautions as possible to prevent contamination. Hmm. So it kind of seems like you run into a bit of a catch-22 though, where it's like in order to determine there's life somewhere, you need to go there, but because there's potentially life there, you can't go there. Yes, well, in, uh, actually I was, uh, I was on a NASA uh, European um, Planetary Protection uh, Committee for a number of years, uh, but I just found it too frustrating because, hmm. um, well, it, it, this was about, eight or nine years ago. In those days, people, you know, the, the planetary protection people were saying, oh, you'll never get hold of the samples, you know, talking about uh, sample return because uh, we'll never allow you. And it was, it was just a real battle. Um, but yes, it's a catch 22 situation. And I think uh, we just have to be as careful as possible uh, but I, I think there will be humans on Mars, who knows when, maybe 2050, something like that. Um, as I said, I, I, I was quite prepared to, uh, to go to Mars myself, um, but um, I will have to leave it to younger people. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Axel, go ahead. Um, Hi, Francis. Uh, thank you very much for a very exciting talk. Uh, thank you, Axel. Uh, uh, wondering about the uh, another field that is often studied by certain and just certain disciplines in astrobiology, and that has to do with the organic material in space. So my question is: Is there any significance in the organic material that is precipitated onto the early Earth or Mars, or is everything? Uh, and can everything necessary for life be built in situ on the on the on the planet? Well, um, organic molecules are f uh, were and still are formed by abiotic processes. They were uh, in the crust, hydrothermal fluids circulating through the crust um, um, can uh, provoke reactions such as Fischer-Tropsch reactions and uh, small molecules like ketones, uh, methane, hydrogen, etc., can be produced. Also, on the in the early atmosphere, uh, uh, certain organics can be formed, but the amount of organics formed this way is small. Uh, the, uh, if if you an, uh, analyze the or quantify the amount of organic uh, molecules for, uh, coming to Earth in extraterrestrial materials, even today, it's huge. Uh, I think today there's something like um, forty thousand tons of meteorites that for, uh, reach the Earth's atmosphere, of which twenty thousand tons reaches the surface. Uh, some of the carbonaceous chondrites contain up to 4% organics. Some of the micrometeorites contain up to 80% organics, but the majority of the organic molecules are refractory. They're not immediately available for life. 25% are, they're volatiles. These organic molecules uh, falling on the early earth into, into the ocean water, uh, they, they will dissolve in the uh, uh, early ocean water and they will be available for, for life. In actual fact, just recently we had a paper out, and we found the, the only and the oldest uh, evidence for extraterrestrial carbon in terrestrial sediments. In these sediments from South Africa, three and a half billion years old. 
uh, is a paper that was, um, the lead author is Didier Gourier, I'm on it as well. And it was published in um, Geochemica Cosmochemica Acta in 2019, if you're interested. But yes. mm -hmm. uh, uh, the extraterrestrial organic matter is very important, or was very important. Mm. Mm. Thanks very much indeed. Next question is Srishma. Go ahead. Maybe you, can, maybe you can read out the question. Yeah, let me just read it. <clears throat> uh, so amazing talk. Thank you so much. If we find fossilized life on Mars, so uh, what can we interpret about the universal universality of origin of life? Mm. This is a, another really, really good question. Uh, in actual fact, there, there are a number of reasons for uh, searching for traces of life on Mars. I didn't go into these reasons, but one of them is uh, because uh, the oldest, I, I mentioned that the oldest best preserved rocks on earth are three and a half billion years old. Uh, this is one billion years after the formation of the Earth. It's also well after the emergence of life, and by 3.5 billion years, life is pretty well developed and uh, uh, diversified. So uh, we basically don't have the first billion years of rock record, and that's on Mars, because Mars hasn't had plate tectonics. Now, um, what, does it, what will it tell us about life? The way we think uh, that life emerged, I gave you this very, very primitive sketch uh, uh, of mine, my, my primitive geology vision of how life emerged from the uh, initial ingredients to uh, a protocell. Um, the, and I also spoke about the early environmental uh, conditions on the Earth, as well as on uh, many other uh, planets and uh, exoplanets. These conditions would have been general. The conditions, uh, life could not never emerge on the Earth today. So knowing that the conditions on early Earth, early Mars, uh, would have been pretty generalized, that the ingredients were generalized, Carbon is one of the most uh, abundant molecules in the universe. Uh, we th this is one of the reasons why we think that life, or at least very primitive life, should be generous. And indeed, if we find traces of life on Mars, uh, well, it, can mean, it means either one of two things. It means either that uh, life, um, life can emerge wherever there are habitable conditions, for, for the emergence of life, or uh, it, it could mean maybe that uh, because life likely, uh, if, if, if it did emerge on, on Mars, it most likely emerged before it emerged on Earth because of the impact with the small planets that created the moon. Uh, could, it, could we be Martians in origin? Uh, so it's, it's that, that's not quite as stupid a question as uh, you may think. You know, we talk about panspermia, the possibility of transfer, transferring viable uh, cells from one planet to another in meteorites. If it's really true, uh, we could be Martians or maybe the Martians could be terrestrial. We'll only find out uh, when we get the samples back from Mars, where we can really, well, ExoMars uh, has the instrumentation to detect traces of life if they, if they were there. Um, but the, it will need to be really verified. It's, it's so difficult in situ. We really need to verify everything in samples that come back. And if the, for instance, if all the molecules are identical, uh, the chirality is identical, the information transfer system is identical. It means contamination in either one direction or the other. If it's different, and we hope it's different, uh, it will mean that uh, life really, yes, uh, can, can emerge wherever there, there's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, Mazin, another question, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your talk about how 
um, organic chemistry moves from these simple uh, chinops molecules um, through to living species and protocells. And I wondered about interstellar chemistry. And we know like from the surveys of WILT2 and the Stardust mission, where we find um, very, very low quantities of pre-solar grains that um, survived um, processing. But it, it, and there are very, these highly refractory minerals such as calcium, aluminum inclusions found in a very distant comet which suggests a great deal of mixing. My, my question is, do you think that um, these interstellar uh, chem chemistries, these molecules, organics that we know formed, do, will, would they complexify in a similar manner in the solar nebula or would they break down and destroy and we would have to start from scratch on the planets? Mm, now that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I know that there are over 200 molecules, organic molecules that have been detected in the interstellar medium. Uh, and they are of various sizes. And as you say, they are very re refractory and uh, very refractory uh, parts of the universe have uh, come to light in some of the ancient inclusions in the meteorites. Now the organic molecules, they, yes, you're, you're right. Uh, if any organic molecules uh, in the, for instance, in, in the solar nebula, uh, that have, uh, are there, you know, the remnants of uh, the supernova explosion that preceded uh, the recondensation of our solar system. Any organic molecules will have been uh, also destroyed, maybe some new formation and uh, some really refractory ones will be preserved and incorporated. In fact, in uh, organic or uh, carbon, carbonaceous molecules are part and parcel of the uh, original ingredients that formed our planets. Uh, th these are abiogenic uh, carbonaceous molecules and uh, um, they, they, they're also part and parcel of the igneous meteorites from Mars and uh, other meteorites. So um, yes, I, I think I haven't answered your question directly because I can't, hmm. uh, but I, I've, I've tried to give you my understanding of the situation. Okay, I'm very much looking forward to the Titan mission when uh, the, we, the Tholins, because the chemistry there is amazing, the, all the photochemistry, yes. simple molecules, and then we have this great complexity forming. Yes. And that would be interesting. So, tell me, I, I, I'm curious, are you working at the Open University? No, I'm at, at the first year at Leeds University. At Leeds, I'm studying, okay, okay. I'm studying the structure of water. Okay, okay, okay. I was just wondering which of the uh, British universities, uh, because, because of your background knowledge. <laughs> uh, I did geology like you, at undergraduate. Okay, nothing wrong with geologists. No. Thank you. Yeah, Srini, do you have a question? No, no, I don't. I, it was a wonderful talk, and I want to thank you, uh, Francis, for the beautiful talk. It was, as you can see, there are lots of questions, and I want to take a back seat on this. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, and uh, see you all next week. Which will be about the the Titan Dragonfly mission. That yeah, the... we have the Dragonfly mission. <laughs> okay, that I'll try to listen into that. Thank okay, you very right. much, and thanks Thank so, once again okay. for the opportunity to talk to you all. And that was uh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, much. Good luck to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>